we are in Kaplankaya on the southwestern coast of Turkey for our annual gathering harvest series. Here we bring together some of the greatest minds with experts, speakers, renowned practitioners and talented performers, all aimed at opening our minds, creating curiosity and imagining a brightest future. I hope you like this interview. Today I am with Bob Thurman. He is a talented popularizer of the Buddha's teachings. He is an American Buddhist writer, scholar and academic. And also the first Westerner Tibetan Buddhist monk ordained by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. A charismatic speaker and author of many books on Tibet, Buddhism, arts, politics and cultures, he has also a podcast called Buddhas Have More Fun. Thank you, Bob, for being with us. Oh, thank you. Merci, Rose. I'm very happy to talk to you here in Kaplankaya. You have a podcast called Buddhas Have More Fun. So why do they have more fun and more yes. fun than whom? Well, Buddhas have more fun because they have discovered that reality is goodness. And ultimately, everything is fine. It's all right. Uh, the famous Ray Charles song, you know, it's all right, it's all right, you know. And uh, they discovered that. Buddhas, not Buddhists. I know many miserable Buddhists. I'm a miserable Buddhist most of the time. I talk myself into feeling better occasionally. But, but, uh, but Buddhas, that is a person who is fully enlightened, uh, who has become transhuman, as people like to say in the modern AI kind of people, you know, uh, who has actually become transhuman, which means fully human, actually, okay. uh, with the full potential that the human being has. Uh, they have more fun because they realize reality is good. They're not scared of it. The rest of the people on our planet, almost all of them, are terrorized by their cultures, by the leaderships of their cultures, either spiritual or political or social, that they're supposed to that reality is dangerous and it's awful and something might happen you might die and then after death terrible things might happen and so on and they're so much terrorized by that by the authorities so they will be submissive to those authorities that um, it's unimaginable that reality could be good live or die whatever and uh, a buddha discovers that and they're not afraid of death they realize there's no such thing really as staying dead, that it's just a change, like you sleep and you wake up. And uh, so they're, they're happy and they have more fun, therefore. As a young American man, uh, what did you find in Buddhism that you didn't find in your culture? I didn't find it, I think, in Buddhism. I think I found, because when we say ism, uh, we think of it as some sort of special cult or some sort of separate place, something like that. What I found was someone who basically was realistic, who had discovered reality. And it had a spiritual side, which I was seeking in a way, but I was completely, I didn't like God as a child at all, the way it was presented by people. And, and you know, Protestant church, I would go, but not all the time because my parents weren't highly you know, uh, faith, religious, this being who had a son and, they, and he was hanging on the wall. I didn't actually think it was anything cute and I didn't like it. And actually later on as a scholar, I was delighted to discover that for 300 years, the Christians never worshiped the crucified Christ. There was no image, no icons of that. They worshiped the Christ, the teacher, you know, who was teaching and throwing over the money changers in the temple and so on. And uh, Christos Pedagogos, what they called in Greek. That was what they worshipped. And only after the Roman Empire decided to make Christianity an official thing, did they go dig up some crucifix, which was their own electric chair. After all, it was an electric chair. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, an execution machine, you know. And I didn't like it as a child, you know. Yeah. Maybe I was reincarnation of some old Christian monk who didn't <laughs> like that particular aspect, you know, which was done by the Romans, after all, not by the Jews, but by the Romans. And um, so I intuitively felt that as a child. And um, when I, what, what I was attracted to Buddhism because it fit more with philosophy to me, uh, which fit with science. And yet it didn't tell me 
what both the scientists and the religious people in the New York culture that I grew up in, the scientists also tell you you can't understand yourself and the world. You just have to follow some authority, go to the doctor, you know, or whatever. And the religious people say only God understands, you can't understand. You just have to believe what doesn't make sense. And neither one did I like. Buddhism said that, or Buddha said, that you can understand yourself and the world. And not only that, you have to understand it if you want to have a good time and have a good life. You should understand what you're doing. And that, to me, made sense. And that's what I didn't find in my culture. A bunch of people following authorities and feeling suppressed, actually, but trying to like achieve within and rise in the hierarchy, but actually not comfortable in their own skin, all of them. Basically. Which difficulties did you find on your way to becoming a Buddhist in America? Uh, I didn't really know much about no. Buddhism in America. It was sort of more, more or less Zen. Mm -hmm. There were some translations by Edward Kanza of the Prajnaparamita Sutras and uh, the Transcendent Wisdom Sutras, Perfection of Wisdom, they called okay. it. And then there was um, Lama Govinda. And actually, the first book I read on uh, Buddhist philosophy was the Fondement de la Mystique Tibetaine, ah. which I read in French, okay. uh, which is his Foundations of Tibetan Mysticism by Lama Anagarika Govinda. And I loved that book. And I read it in Paris, actually, and when I was uh, 18 years old. And uh, I loved that. And then I read, I was recommended by Henry Miller to read The Life of Milarepa, you know, the great Tibetan saint. And so those two books were what really got me interested in Tibet and in Buddhism as well as the translation of some scriptures and some Zen things, you know. But I didn't really know that much about it. And when I decided finally to drop out of college and go seek spiritual teaching or something, what it was, was I wanted, I was really attracted to India. And I thought they, they have yoga. So they must have something, I would call it, I think I called it in those days, a yoga of the emotions. And also, I loved the Wittgenstein and Nietzsche among the philosophers. Kant also. I didn't like Hegel, actually, but I like Nietzsche and Wittgenstein. And, um, and uh, so I went to see somebody who would teach me some yoga of the emotions. Okay. And when I got to India, after meeting many Sufis, many Greek Christian mystics in Greece, I came through this part of Turkey, actually as a pilgrim, as a fakir, when I was 20, And, um, and um, when I got to India, I, by that time, I really wanted Buddha. And I discovered Indians didn't really have a clear idea about Buddha at that time, uh, but Tibetans did. And the Tibetans were just coming out in exile from India. This was 1962, 61 years ago. And uh, uh, so the minute I met the Tibetans, I knew they had, and there was something about them. They had the knowledge that I wanted. They had, the, they had the sort of presence that I was interested in. And so I immediately got into that. Okay. It was both your, uh, your mind and also um, your interest in uh, literature, in, uh, in the text, in everything. It was both, both of them and your heart. Yeah, probably, your body. Yeah, probably it was a fortunate stupidity, <laughs> which was that my youthful arrogance about my intelligence was that I insisted I had to be able to understand things. And I didn't like anybody telling me you couldn't understand. And of course, I didn't understand. <laughs> I was very deluded. But, you know, it was like teenage uh, omniscience or something like that. And it was encouraged by the Tibetans. And actually, of course, luckily, Buddha is someone who did understand. And he made a, he said, actually, I can't help you understand. I can't make you understand. He said, that was, was also great. He said, I can't order you to understand. Or just whatever I say is not going to make you understand. But I can be like a coach. You know, I can help you find the understanding in yourself. Because you, or human beings, have the ability to understand. And in fact, it's not healthy for you to run around not understanding and just following orders. The fact that it was a counterculture, hippies uh, were also a, to, a little bit into Buddhism. Uh, did it appeal to you also or not? I was a middle son. I had an older and a younger brother. 
And um, my family, the people were quite theatrical. My mother was an actress. My father was a translator and a thinker. And he, he had a very spiritual side, but he wasn't church going. And, um, but, you know, in the theatrical family, there would be sort of storms, you know, emotional storms, tantrums. People would have tantrums and things. And I would tend to, I was actually the peacemaker because when it would get too much, I would say, I am now leaving home. And I would actually pick up whatever belongings I consider were mine and I would leave. And then they would stop what it was. And, uh, but I think probably I was just very irritating to everybody because my wife pointed out once I later, my second wife, who we've been with together for 56 years now, 57 years, I sort of said, yeah, I had a difficult childhood, I sort of said, you know, what used to say. And then she found some old pictures uh, when my mother passed away, and she showed me and she said, actually, in all these family pictures, the only person smiling is you. <laughs> <laughs> so I can only interpret that as meaning that I was annoying everybody else. That's, <laughs> that's why they were all so upset. And they, but they would stop when I left because uh, they didn't want me to leave. They felt some responsibility for me. But then I also left high school before I heard of Buddhism. I, was, I had all kinds of Latino friends at the fancy boarding school that I went to. And um, they were from Mexico and Venezuela, but also from elite right-wing families. And um, they were trying to be rebellious also. And so we, two of us left on a dare to join Fidel Castro's revolution in 1958 when I was 17, which was totally stupid. We didn't know anything about communists or anything. We just thought he was a poet in the Sierra Maestre, and we were going to go. And luckily, they refused our, uh, our uh, subscription, you know, or whatever Why? you call it. Well, because we were ridiculous, 17-year-olds, you know. Yeah, too young. And, uh, and actually, I was very tall and skinny, 6'3", 150 pounds. My friend was short and fat. He was 5'3", uh, and 180 pounds. So when we came into the bar in Miami Beach where they were recruiting, they said, after they rejected us, which they did immediately, they said, oh, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza are coming to save the revolution. <laughs> they were laughing. And then I went to Mexico and I lived there for a year, you know, and I uh, had a fun time there. And, um, and then I, went to, I came back to college without getting high school diploma because I, was at, I had advanced standing. And I was a sophomore already. You know? So they let me in. They, the dean of admission was very kind. He said, oh, yeah, I told you you had to get a, college, a high school degree and you had to finish and blah, blah, blah. And then he said, but you didn't. But he says, probably if I don't let you in, you'll go to waste, he said. Which he was very nice. Nowadays, that wouldn't happen, you know. It's become so elitist, the whole thing. Can you tell me about your first meeting with the Dalai Lama? Well, when I first met him was in 1964. And my old Mongolian teacher, who was my prime teacher, uh, who actually lived in New Jersey. I went all the way to India to find the guru. And then my father passed away and I had to go back to New York for a few weeks. And I met this Mongolian who became my real first teacher. He was an amazing person. And um, he was from the same monastery as Jimbalas, uh, or same nearby monastery to Jimbalas, Gagishi, you know. And um, then I was bugging him for a year or two to be a monk because I was so in love with the, the Buddhist teaching and meditating. And, and of course, he was blocking me from meditating also. He didn't like me meditating. He wanted me to learn. And um, I was speaking fluently Tibetan and so on. So he said, you're, you're not going to be a monk. I'm not making you a monk. In Tibetan, you have to be a monk for life. You can't be a monk because you're not going to be a monk. And I kept not listening. So then finally, he had to go to India. And he would see Dalai Lama. He was training some young monks for Dalai Lama in New Jersey in his monastery there. And he said, I'll take you along since you're such a pest. And maybe Dalai Lama will make you a monk, he said. But then when he first introduced me to Dalai Lama, and then I bowed to Dalai Lama, because I'd learned how to do that by then. And, um, and then he said, well, this American boy speaks uh, Tibetan really well already and already understands a few things. And um, he's just determined to be a monk. And uh, so I told him I'd bring him to you, he says to the Dalai Lama. But then, and then I'm all happy, I'm ready to be a monk. And then he says to the Dalai Lama, but don't make him a monk. Because he <laughs> he's not supposed to be a monk. 
But then, and then he said, but you know, you're the Dalai Lama, you decide, you know. I'm just an old Mongolian monk, you know, so. But I say, don't make him a monk because his karma is like, not like that. He says, and then I'm like, why are you saying that? You said you'd bring him a monk. <laughs> and I'm annoyed with him. And um, so his holiness was kind of chuckling about that. And, and at that very moment, his holiness was a little tense because he was about to give a speech at a world conference of Buddhists in the Sarnath, where the Buddha originally gave teaching in near about Banaras, Varanasi. And, he, and he, it was a difficult presentation for him because at that period in 1964, the other Buddhists from Burma and Sri Lanka and Japan, and they were all a little weird about Tibetan Buddhism because uh, Tantra, except for one school in Japan, the, nobody really knew much about Tantra and the other Buddhist things, and the, there was a wrong attitude about it, there was something corrupt about it, something wrong with it. And so he was a monk, a proper monk, and he was talking Buddhist ethics and Buddhist philosophy, and, and then they were muttering to each other, well, he's quite nice. He seems like a real regular Buddhist monk. Like, how can he be from the Tibetan shamanistic weird thing, you know? The, the, in other words, over many years, he had to kind of represent that Tibetan Buddhism is a real full-scale Indian Buddhism, you know? Yeah. And uh, that moved up over the hills into Tibet and, and had a lot to share with um, the, the other Buddhist forms of Buddhism that were further away from the heartland of Buddhism in North India, you know, after it was destroyed in North India, you know. So he, which he's done an awesome planetary job, you know. That's all it is. So how do you, how did you fin finally uh, make him do, convince him to make you a, a monk, the Dalai Lama? Well, uh, then he was a little slow about me. He didn't mean make me a monk instantly. And, um, but you know, what happened was that we became very good friends because he was only six years older than me, and he was studying a lot himself at that time. And he had all this tremendous responsibility of the community in exile and also trying to speak for the people being tortured in their homeland. But yet he had a kind of outlet. He had not had another Westerner who spoke Tibetan fluently since Heinrich Harrer, you know, the German mountain climber back in the 40s. And, and uh, Uh, who, you know, he, so he'd not had anyone who could sort of explain Freud or Nietzsche or I was not so good in like um, me mechanical physics and things like that, you know, but I, I knew something even already then about quantum and physics. I was a bit I like that. So I would have to make up words in Tibetan to explain concepts and things like that. And we had a lot of conversations and um, we became quite friendly. And, uh, and um, I think he... He, he realized, um, he, you know, I would stay with them and I intended to stay for life. I was not believing the old geisha who said I would not be do, destined to be a monk. I was ready to be a total monk forever, you know. And uh, so he said, well, he really wants to do it, so let's do it. And they included me in the ceremony and, you know, I got my robes and shaved my head and this and that. And, um, and I was a serious, and then I was annoying everybody as a monk. <laughs> because Tibetans have a relaxed uh, about it. And uh, for example, they tend to eat in the evening. Uh, and uh, the old monk thing, you can't eat afternoon, only one meal a day in the morning and so on. And I insisted on doing that. And I was like fussing about everything. I was in pain, you know, I was very, very purist, you know. And, um, and I loved it. And I was got, wanted to be a geisha. And I was memorizing books and gung ho. And actually the old Mongolian guy though, he made me do one other thing which was very prophetic of him. He made me study Tibetan medicine with the Dalai Lama's personal physician who was restarting the Tibetan Medical Institute that the Tibetans had had in Lhasa of their traditional medicine, which is like Ayurveda. It's marvelous tradition. Okay. It's now a major complementary uh, medical tradition. And he told me, Well, yes, you can do philosophy. You can try to keep trying to contain enlightenment and meditate and all this, and learn about emptiness. But because you're long term involved with Tibet, you need to know about the culture. And the way to learn about the culture is to understand the medicine. And it was revelatory for me to study really? Tibetan medicine. Okay. It's a marvelous. Learn about what the kidney does, what the liver does, what the heart and the lungs, and, and how to read the pulse and all this sort of thing. I, I did learn all of that. 
And, and natural, I found natural it very fascinating. To, okay. Is it natural always? Uh, well, it's very, they have amazing, very deeply scientific, botanical, and also insightful diagnostic tradition, how to cultivate diagnostic intuition and so on. That's really amazing. And how, how you can feel through the pulse, the way the blood goes through different organs like the liver and the kidney and the upper intestine and so on, as well as how it pumps in the heart. And um, quite sophisticated. And uh, you memorize the whole thing, and then you you can sort of hear that you hear these 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 rhythms in the body in other places than just the heart by by looking working on the two wrists. I mean, it's marvelous, you know. Mm -hmm. And I did really learn it, but unfortunately, I never really practiced the medicine afterwards because I got into being a professor and so on. So what happened after two years? Uh, you decided you spent two years there as a monk. Yes, and after, how I had already been living two years as a monk. So okay, in so a way, I four? spent four years as four a monk. Four years, okay. But but uh, formally with the robe and everything, two years, and uh, it was very strict. And um, and then I was sent on a mission to uh, South America by the government in exile with the Lama to see about uh, making a Tibetan colony there, perhaps in Argentina. And I, because I'd lived in Mexico, I could speak Spanish still, and I translated Tibetan to Spanish. And um, the Argentines didn't want to have a Tibetan colony, so it, would, it did fail. But we, it was nice. We met a lot of spiritual people in Argentina and um, had fun and so on. And then I came back in New York. And uh, then um, I stayed at the old monastery with the old Lama there for a while, my original teacher. And during that period, I was memorizing, getting ready to go back to study in, in Dharamsala and so on. Uh, but then it was the height of the anti-Vietnam War protests and some of my, and also the civil rights uh, protests in America and my peers in America, you know, my classmates from different things would come by the monastery and take a breather there. Then they'd go out and they were on the front line of the resistance, you know, sort of thing. And then I started a little bit marching with them as a monk, you know, that was Vietnam, Vietnam guy was burned himself and so on. So I sort of got to be, I was beginning to be kind of activist monk. Then my old Mongolian teacher says, you can't do that. Okay. We're, this is not a Buddhist country, uh, you're, uh, you're, uh, you're like a Tibetan here, sort of, and you can't go out with your old friends there and be activists, you know, okay, in, the, you were too in the movement, okay. you have to stay here, or you have to leave and go live outside of the monastery and so on, and, and then at first, I, okay, then I won't go, but then the pull of that, and then at a certain point, I kind of had a, had a vision of what the old one had originally been saying, that if I had been a, if I had been destined to again be a monk in this lifetime as an American monk, then uh, I would have been more, or as a monk, period, just seeking my own enlightenment, then I would be, I could have been born in Tibetan exile community. You know, I could have chosen another birth. But instead I chose to be born in New York City in the beginning of World War I, World War II. And um, I had a destiny of that sort, you know, and then his, all his statements to me about how your long-term karma is not to be a monk began to resonate with me. And um, so I eventually resigned, you know. And then when I tried to resign, well, there's a way you resign where you give back your robes. Was it painful? And I tried to give them back to the old uh, Lama. He said, you don't give them back to me. I didn't ordain you. You have to send them to India. <laughs> <laughs> but I had no money. I was very poor. My father had died, etc. I didn't want to be a burden on my mother, so so I couldn't travel to India, and uh, etc. You know, whatever. You know, I, I wasn't able to formally resign for a few years, actually. But I was no longer a monk. Okay, was it painful? It's embarrassing in the Tibetan culture. I mean, Jimala. It's not embarrassing for a Tibetan in a way. Because in exile, you know, they've all changed a little bit and they've, some of them have had to leave, although a lot of them have remained monks. But, but in the Tibetan system, it's not like Thailand, like he was saying, where it's okay to be an ex-monk. It isn't really okay. It's, a, it's like you've let down your lifelong, because you take the vow for life, you know. And I had sincerely done so. And the Mongolian uh, teacher of mine admitted that I was sincere about it. He just said, you don't know what's going to happen to you. And he was right, you know, and I was wrong, you know. Exactly. You know? yeah. And then, of course, luckily for me, I met my current wife and um, we, uh, we fell quite in love and all that. You know? So you, you had a family. 
And we were considered the least likely to succeed. Well, we, we just had each other, actually. And she was a famous fashion model at that time. And uh, Richard Avedon covers on every way and all this. But she was sick of that and sort of ready to leave that. She wanted to have a family too. I didn't know what the meaning of family or that family myself. But uh, having been living as a monk for four and a half years, but um, during my early 20s, you know, it was really quite a meeting. But all her friends in the fashion world and in, in, this, in her, her world, what are you taking up with this <laughs> ex-monk, you know? And then my sort of Dharma friends were like, well, how can you be this worldly person, you know, sort of routine thing. And, uh, but uh, there was You're no stopping us. There was no year. stopping us, kind of, except our own problems, of course, that we everyone else has. But uh, we were we got very serious, yeah. And is she she is into Buddhism? Yes, she. You well, she um, she's sort of had her own version of that, of enlightenment. I would say very much so, and but and she hadn't really encountered much the formal Buddhist teaching. But what she would say was when she would hear me teaching somebody else or something because we were not exactly uh, studying Dharma together. But when she would hear me explain something, she would say, "Oh." Well, oh, if I could have figured it out myself, that's how I would have understood it, sort of thing. So she had this affinity, natural affinity, and became very strong. But neither of us were ever strongly sort of a fanatic uh, card-carrying, like, you know, in other words, the thing about ism, of Buddhism, the Buddhism, the ism part is that the Buddhist thing, except in some cases, it's not a matter of just having that name or the denomination, your membership thing, you know. It's a matter of pursuing a certain path of developing the mind, you know, and developing the heart and interacting with other people ethically and so on. It's more like that, that you then are following the path, you know what I mean, rather than just, I'm a Buddhist, you know. Although I a little bit had that because I loved it so much. I, it was marvelous. It was like just... When I would learn, when I was learning Tibetan first with the old Mongolian and listen, listening to teachings of Nagarjuna, the great philosopher, each, each, each word was like written in gold and it would just come off the page and go right in my heart. It was just so fantastic. I couldn't, I couldn't even believe it. It was just so perfect. You, know? you became a teacher uh, at Columbia. How, was it, uh, how are the kids from there, interested in, in uh, Buddhism, are different from uh, the kid, and you call it you d Buddhology. Yes. How are the oh, kids? Buddhology, yes. Yeah, how are well, the kids I have different a, from today? Yes, at Harvard I did something funny, which I'm very proud of, which was when I presented my dissertation for the PhD, which was after some years after that. But um, uh, when I did, I wrote Buddhology was my subfield within Sanskrit and Indian studies. And then the professors, they didn't, we didn't have such a subfield. So one professor asked the other one, oh, do we have a subfield of Buddhology? He says, and the other one says, well, we do now. Because <laughs> oh, I was so very happy with that. it. So then it created a new subfield, and I was very pleased with that. Because what that means, you see, Buddhology means, the logi means study of. So study of enlightenment. You see, whereas Buddhist studies means study of what Buddhists do. And of course, modern people don't think Buddha was enlightened. They, they can't because they were, he was a modern, you know. As I tell my colleagues in academia, I say, you study about Buddhism, but you don't believe Buddha was enlightened. And of course, that's part of your profession is you don't believe that. And why? Because Buddha didn't have a PhD from the Sorbonne, and you do. Right? And that makes you enlightened and not him. Because <laughs> he's a pre-modern, you know, okay. ancient person. You have this, we have all this arrogance that we in the modern world are the most enlightened <laughs> that ever walked. <laughs> which is proven false by the earth itself, which we're destroying at a great rate. Meaning we're very unenlightened that we're destroying our own home, you know. And uh, we're, our materialism is in crack, incredibly backward and so on. Uh, you know, the idea that there's no spirit, no mind, no future life, no past life, no larger destiny and purpose of life than just making money and having fun, you know, and a superficial level of fun. And so, uh, so actually we're backward and we need civilizing, taming the barbarian Westerners, you know, we do. We conquered them, but that's not because we're better, it's because we're meaner. 
We, we, used it, we were more violent, successfully, and we conquered them in colonialism. But the people who conquer are not the superior. The people who get conquered are maybe more gentle and more, more aware of life, actually. In fact, I think someday that will be understood, personally. In a world that is more and more uh, polarized mm. and uh, polarization and yes. uh, fragmentation, um, as a free talker like you, and uh, how do you look at this? Well, I don't think the world is more polarized than it ever was. What I think is this amazing technology that is now happening Amplifying. from the human coming from the human genius and this sort of intersharing of information about everything. But unfortunately, of course, false and true information as well. But this is just bringing to the surface what has been there all along because of because as I said before, People in cultures of authoritarian cultures on this planet for the last maybe 5,000 years approximately, according to some feminist archaeologists that I know, the Maria Jimbutas and other people, um, they have been terrorized by the authorities in the different cultures that even if there's such a thing as God, God is mostly angry. And, you know, if you had too much fun or you did something wrong, you were going to go hell, some horrible eternal torture. I mean, that is the most sadistic idea that anybody ever dreamed of. And then if there's no one, then the animals are going to eat you or the enemy is going to invade your country. So everybody's against you and everybody's frightened and fear dominates the way the society is organized. And therefore, some leader, the general or the high priest, the pope or the cardinal or the supreme mufti or whoever it is or even the Dalai Lama if they supposedly think it's an authority then then uh, you just have to do what they say whether it makes sense to you or not because you're so scary you need someone else to defend you and you invent an omnipotent god who you think will defend you and then when you believe in an omnipotent god actually when horrible things happen to you you subconsciously are angry with him <laughs> of course why did he do that to me They have Job being, okay, uh, let's have the locusts, kill my wife, kill my children. Da, da, da. But actually, nobody will believe that. Nobody will think that unconsciously. Elie Wiesel, after the Holocaust, he was angry with God, openly. He said so. How could God let that happen? And, and so that's a, it's really a mistake to believe anybody else is omnipotent. We all are omnipotent about our own lives, how we behave with others. And we, of course, are not omnipotent, so we have to interact with other beings. And that's the fundamental teaching of the enlightened being. That's, that's the world religion of kindness. That's Dalai Lama's fundamental teaching. We, we depend on kindness of stranger human being, mother's breast. How long? You know, my, you know children depend on their parents in the middle classes until they're at least... 50. <laughs> They have to help the parents help to get a mortgage to buy a house. You know? And uh, we're very dependent on each other, right? Aren't we? Yeah. yeah. And that's reality, you know. So, but actually, and actually, the real individual who really is responsible for themselves, they are very happy to depend on others. And then they depend in an ethical and responsible and friendly way because they know that's a way of getting along with other people. And then other people will be friendly with them, usually. There'll be some hard cases, but usually that will be the case. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's the, way of, that's the way we have to live, you know. And that's what we have to do, not particular this religion or that religion, but we have to, whatever, mech, whatever resources the different spiritual traditions have, the Christ, the Muhammad, the Moses, Krishna, who, uh, Lao Tzu, whoever it is, we need whatever resources we have in those cultures to, to uh, behave well and treat life well, and it will treat us well. We'll say we will not wreck this planet. We have to stop wrecking it. If there was a movie about you, because you have a... Uh Friends who are actor, a daughter who's yes, an actress, yes. it's in your family. Yes. If there was a movie about you and you're even thinking about making a movie, you told me. Well, I want to make a movie about Buddha's life, not me. And However, if there was a, yeah. I do have a friend who is a, a well-known director, a nominated director. I think he has an award or two. He was, he is a, he was a student of mine when he was in college. 
and we remained good friends. And he, he immediately came up with a, a very important scene in the movie about me, which is not the most important thing, actually, in the movie about me. It might be some situation where I'm trying not to be angry with my wife, trying to listen to her advice rather than insist on my idea. That would be the most important thing to, in a movie about me, but which I haven't completely mastered even that, but, uh, but that would be important. But uh, the scene he visualized that I think is great is where there's a kind of reverse Socrates trial or a, a, that Scopes trial in the U.S., you know, the Darwinian trial, you know. Yeah. But in this case, I'm being tried by the materialists, the natural scientists, uh, for teaching the reality, the, the, the physical reality, the scientifically verifiable reality of former and future lives, of the soul, of people having had previous life and having their own evolutionary history, which we call karma, and of having future lives, and therefore being responsible for the consequences of their action, even past death, and for teaching that to the young, like for Socrates, you know, you're supposed to be poisoned with the hemlock, you know, yeah. or you should be exiled or kicked out of the university and so on. And uh, he had a scene like that in some place at Columbia University where they'd be trying me. How can you corrupt the youth with this like superstitious idea since we, the modern scientists, what we know is that the human beings have no mind and spirit. They just have a brain that tricks them into thinking they exist. And actually it's a random accident. It has no purpose or meaning. And the minute you die, you're nothing. So death is just anesthetization for eternity, which is a total lie. And there is no evidence for it whatsoever. And no scientist has discovered nothing and can prove nothing. It is a complete dogma. But they will be trying me, and we will be having an argument like that, <laughs> and I will win that argument. But he doesn't necessarily think I will win, but I know I will win. Because Who would you what, like to well, All you have to ask those people is, actually, who got the Nobel Prize for discovering nothing? That you're selling to everybody, like, that's their safety, where they're going. They're just, and you're anesthetized for life. And they're suiciding themselves by the, by the hundreds, by the thousands on this planet. Where do you get the evidence for assuring them there will be nothing? And therefore, this is a solution. Meanwhile, they're going to be in a, in a dream state in the bardo with a tremendous headache if they do that. Who would you play uh, the young you? Who would play me? Yeah, the actor. Who would you like to play well, you? Well, the young me, would. I think my grandson, Levon, would probably do a great job. He looks a little bit like me when I was like that. Uh, that's uh, Uma's son, okay. uh, uh, her, and uh, he he would play it. I mean, he might be embarrassed to play grandpa, but <laughs> I don't think so. He's very very together and very smart, okay. and he looks like me when I was uh, when I was uh, younger. In fact, uh, there was some old portrait my mother has when I was playing uh, Troilus at Harvard. In my during my first marriage, and when I was about 19, and maybe 19, I mean, I was playing Charles and Cressida in uh, Shakespeare, you know, and uh, the opening of the Loeb Theater at Harvard in the drama department. And uh, there's a speech Charles makes because of the loss of Troy, you know, the destruction of Troy and the loss of Cressida, you know, that's a big sort of lamentation speech. And uh, I had the audience weeping. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, somebody, some famous person came backstage and said that I did a great job. And then it's, I can't remember the speech. Why? Like, blah, blah, blah. Wow, how can things go so bad and all that? So I had a little like that. He's like that, Levon. I think he could play me as a young me. Thank you very much, Bob. Okay. Okay. okay perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you My so friend. much. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Harvest series. If you want to hear more, don't forget to click on the subscribe button and see you soon for our next episode.